Hi everybody, this is the lecture to accompany Chapter 10 in your textbook. Please read Chapter 10 as there are many important ideas that I simply don't have time to discuss in this lecture. Okay, let's talk about romantic and family relationships. Romantic and family relationships are intimate in nature. The term intimacy tends to be associated with sexuality, but that is not necessarily what I am talking about. The book refers to intimacy as emotional closeness and deep knowledge that you have of another person. Now that person might be someone with whom you have a sexual relationship, but it might also be someone to whom you are related, such as a parent or a child or a brother or a sister. So intimacy applies to all those different types of relationships. Intimate relationships require deep commitment, and commitment is the willingness, the desire, and even the promise you make to someone to stay in and to maintain that relationship no matter what happens. Intimate relationships also foster what is called interdependence. In other words, every person in that relationship is dependent on the other person. So each person's actions affect everyone else in the relationship. And intimate relationships usually have high levels of interdependence. Last week, we talked about friendships that there are costs and benefits to friendships. Well, the same is even more true of intimate relationships. Intimate relationships require continuous investment in the maintenance of that relationship. Investment is the commitment that you make to that other person of pretty much all your resources, your money, your time, your love, and people in those intimate relationships are very well aware of how much it costs, and I put cost in quotation marks, because we are aware of the cost and we are willing to pay that cost. Intimate relationships spark something called dialectical tensions, and dialectical tensions are conflict between two very important but opposing needs. So let me give you examples of what I'm talking about in each one of those. So autonomy, which is the feeling that you want to be your own person and you want some independence in your life versus that desire and need to be connected to other people. So those two things can clash sometimes. So you might want to have your own money that you can spend the way you want to without anybody else telling you how to spend it versus having a shared bank account where you both have to talk about the ways in which that money is spent because you are sharing those responsibilities. Openness versus closeness has to do with being open and being able to tell somebody everything about every aspect of your life, which is a way that you can connect with another person, versus closeness and having some areas of your life that you really want to keep, not necessarily secret, but just to yourself. Is it always necessary to tell another person in an intimate relationship absolutely every single thing about your life. And then predictability versus novelty. Predictability, that security, that knowledge that somebody is always going to be there, that the same things are going to happen on a daily basis, makes some people feel very good versus novelty, new, interesting, different situations. So as you can see, many conflicts in intimate relationships spring up because of the push and pull between those very important things that we all need, but how they affect the intimate relationship. There are a lot of different characteristics of romantic relationships. The first one, exclusivity, is the expectation, particularly in Western society, that you are going to be monogamous in that relationship. But that is not always the case. There are some relationships in our society that are called open. Open means that 
both partners have decided that the other partner can have a sexual relationship outside of the relationship that those two have together. And that can work in some situation. However, if somebody decides to have a sexual relationship outside of their relationship that the other person is still monogamous and does not know about it, then that is called infidelity. And when they find out, that can certainly put an end to that relationship. Also, there are some societies where polygamy is practiced, and in that society, it is considered perfectly fine and possibly even better if, uh, and it's generally a man is allowed to have more than one wife. There are societies where that is acceptable behavior. Romantic relationships and voluntariness. Voluntariness means that you choose for yourself. And certainly in Western society, that is one of the things that we consider one of our basic rights, that we may choose whoever we want, as long as that person chooses us also, and that nobody else can have a say in who we are to marry. But that is not the case in other cultures. There are many cultures in which the two people who are becoming a couple have no say in that and that those relationships are chosen by people outside of that relationship, usually the family members. And then romantic relationships and love. Now, certainly in Western culture, marriages are assumed to be based on love. However, other cultures, that is not the most important thing. And historically, it was not the most important thing even in Western society. But it has only been in the forefront of Western society a little over a century and a half. In terms of sexuality, same-sex marriages in America are becoming much more commonplace and much more accepted than they have been over the past few decades. Although still in many areas of the world, that is still not considered to be appropriate or even lawful. And then there is the idea of permanence and in Western society. The ideal is that you are permanently with that other person. However, we know that that is far from the norm as about half of relationships in the United States end in divorce or separation. Nobody goes into a marriage relationship thinking that, oh, probably in five or ten years I will divorce this person. Of course you expect it to be permanent, but of course life tends to get in the way of that sometimes. So according to the textbook, there is something called NAP's five-stage model of relationship development. And this is the way that, particularly in Western society, we fall in love. And the five steps are initiating, experimenting, intensifying, integrating, and bonding. The initiating step is where you meet and interact for the first time. And similarly to what we talked about in chapter nine about friendship, there is some kind of attraction that occurs in this meeting where you find something that attracts you to that other person. Then the second step is experimenting. And in the experimenting stage, you are finding out about that person, asking questions, spending a little more time with them, decide whether or not this person has enough of the qualities that you find attractive. And then in the third step, intensifying, this is where you spend more and more time with that person. Uh, you may become a little bit more intimate sexually and you find those things about that other person that make you believe that you want to keep this relationship and intensify it more. Then the fourth stage is called integrating and this is where you begin to make a commitment to that other person and you begin to think of yourselves as a pair rather than two separate individuals. You find that you are one entity. And finally, the fifth stage, the bonding stage, where you make it public. You let everybody know that you are now a couple. Now, obviously, these stages can vary depending on people. Some people, they go through those five stages very quickly. Some people, it takes a long time. And certainly other cultures, particularly if your significant other is chosen for you, then you may be at the bonding stage 
before you are even at the experimenting stage. So these stages obviously can vary. According to Marianne Fitzpatrick, she spent many years studying marriages. And what she says is that there are four cognitive models for what people believe marriage should be. And so they tend to fall into these four marital types. Traditional couples take a culturally traditional view of marriage, and they believe that there are strong separations between work and child rearing, and when conflict arises, spouses in this type of marriage tend to face it rather than to avoid it. Separate couples are similar to couples in traditional marriages, except that the spouses are autonomous rather than interdependent. And they have separate interests, but they still work together to maintain the marriage. However, because they are not as interdependent as traditional couples, then they generally don't tend to engage in conflict. Whereas independent couples are even more separated than what we call the separate couples. They don't generally believe in the traditional marriage where the man goes to work and the woman stays home. They may indeed have two separate lives with separate friends, but they are still committed to their marriage and work on it together. About half the time, there is something called a mixed relationship in which one person sees the marriage as a particular type and the other person sees it as a different type. And communication patterns in those couples most likely reflect the particular expectation that each spouse holds for that relationship. Speaking of conflict, there are a lot of different ways in which people handle conflict. And there are four different types of couples when it comes to conflict. Validating couples are the ones who are more likely to be open about their disagreements, but also cooperative. They are trying to work through. So they listen to each other, they try to understand the other person's viewpoint, and they try to settle their disagreements cooperatively. Volatile couples also discuss disagreements openly, but they tend to be a little more competitive. One of them, or both of them, are more interested in winning the argument and being the person that is right. So it can get hostile, <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily need to. Then there are conflict avoiding couples where they would rather do anything than argue openly. So I would call them more passive aggressive in nature and they are more likely to do things to each other <laughs> rather than say things to each other um, because the, the communication is difficult for them. Hostile couples, on the other hand, are not afraid to have both open and covert kinds of disagreements, and they have frequent, intense conflict. I would not want to be in that kind of relationship where you're insulting, um, being rude to each other all the time, because I would say in most cases that those couples are going to end up breaking up. Romantic relationships also vary in how they handle privacy. There's something called the communication privacy management theory that explains how people manage the tension between privacy and disclosure. Since partners in a couple jointly own the information about their relationship, they are responsible for forming and managing privacy boundaries. So if you have two people in a relationship and one of them is very private and doesn't feel comfortable about explaining to people outside the relationship about the details of that relationship, and then the other person is very open and has no problem talking to other people about what's going on in the relationship, that could get a little sticky. Our decisions about sharing information are influenced by the people to whom we're disclosing it, by how much we trust those people, and by how much they've disclosed to us. 
So we really have to, within relationships, be aware of information that your romantic partner expects you to keep private because that could add to the conflict in a relationship if you're willing to talk to people outside the relationship about it, but the other person isn't happy about you sharing that information. These are things that couples have to work out. Romantic relationships also vary in how they handle emotional communication. Research says that how romantic partners express emotion to each other can say a lot about the quality of their relationship. Specifically, it shows how satisfied the partners are with each other. And happy partners share more positive emotion with each other and less negative emotion than do unhappy partners. And of course, unhappy partners are more likely than happy partners to reciprocate expressions of negative emotion. Finally, romantic relationships vary in how they handle instrumental communication. If you remember what instrumental communication is, that is the way we talk to each other about the day-to-day tasks that we have to do to get through the day. And of course, if you're in a relationship, then there are plenty of tasks, not just for the relationship, but for the household, for your lives, that require completion. And so the way in which partners divide those everyday tasks often reflect the balance of power in a relationship. So if one person expects somebody else to do particular tasks, that says a lot about what they think about their level of power as opposed to that other person's level of power. And interestingly enough, women are more likely than men to feel that the division of instrumental tasks is unfair. And those feelings reduce their relational satisfaction. So the idea that men expect women to clean the house is a traditional one, but one that women also don't feel like they should necessarily have to do all by themselves. So we talked about how romantic relationships begin. We talked about the different ways in which people communicate with each other in those relationships. Now we're going to talk about how romantic relationships can end. I have to tell you before I start talking about these different stages that most relationships, even if they last an entire lifetime, go through at least one or two of these stages. It's very common. And at any point in these stages, you can stop, recognize what's going on, and turn it around and have a successful relationship. But because 40% of uh, at least American marriages tend to end in divorce, you probably should understand how that happens communication-wise. So the first step is called differentiating. And differentiating is just where you start to recognize that you indeed have differences, that even though you are bonded to this person, they're very different from you to the point where those things that seemed kind of charming (laughs) when you first began the relationship start to be more annoying than charming so you know and it doesn't have to be anything really intensely bad just recognizing that okay I used to think this was cute now I don't now that's a very common thing to think in a relationship and particularly marriage where you're with the same person for a long period of time But that may go into the second stage, which is called circumscribing. And that is where both the quality and the quantity of your communication with that other person begins to decline. So you spend a little more time apart, you're talking a little less to each other, and it just kind of builds up from there and can lead to the third stage, which is called stagnating. Stagnating is where you're doing the same thing for a certain period of time 
and you just realize that you are going through the motions in this relationship. And like I said, all these things can certainly happen to even a happy marriage, but the ones that stay together are the ones that recognize this and start to turn it around. The fourth step you're kind of leading towards the end at the avoiding stage. The avoiding stage is when you and your partner decide that you're no longer willing to keep going in this stagnant relationship and you just start simply avoiding each other. So you put mental distance, emotional distance, maybe even physical distance between each other. A separation might occur here. And that usually, not always, you can get back together at this point. But at least in 40% of cases, it leads to terminating the relationship. Even if you're not married, breaking up with your intimate partner can be very demanding and painful. And certainly divorcing is a major issue in the United States. And the dissolution of a marriage can cause a lot of heartache and pain. Sometimes, however, indeed, depending on what's going on in the relationship, it may be for the best. Now that you understand the steps that happen before people break up, if you're in one of these stages, you need to take stock of that and decide if indeed you can or if you want to turn it around. So now let's move to communicating in families. The term family is so all-encompassing that we kind of have to define what exactly a family is. So what are the things that make a family? Well, the first kind of thing that makes a family is genetics. The blood relationships you have with your mother, your father, your siblings, your children. But not all families have genetic ties. There are also families in which people are adopted or married into, so you have step families. And some people just call themselves a family and yet have no genetic connection at all. There are uh, lots of legal obligations that go with families. Parents have many legal obligations. They're not just responsible to those children, but they are also responsible for them. Lots of laws define the things that parents have to do for their children to take care of them, to make sure that they are housed and fed and educated. But also, if a child does something, a parent may indeed be held responsible for it if that child is not of legal age. So a lot of legality goes into a family. And then there are simply the role behaviors. Whether a family is genetically tied or not, a family is a family because it acts like one. The people within those relationships take on those roles that are associated with the care and commitment to those other people in those relationships. So there are a lot of different types of families. You have a family of origin and that is where you came from. The family of origin is the family in which you are a child. So that would consist of your parents and your siblings. However, when you grow up and create a family of your own, that is your family of procreation. The nuclear family is the American ideal with the mom, the dad, the 2.4 children. There are many people who do not fit into that category. There are certainly blended families where there is a mom, dad, and some children from each one of those previous marriages and even single parent families where one parent has the major responsibility of taking care of their offspring. In all family relationships, communication of course plays a big part in keeping the family together or breaking the family up. So there are things called family roles and these are the functions that people, that individuals serve within the family system and particularly during conflict uh, which we're going to talk about next week these four roles come to the forefront and maybe if you think about your family and how they act during conflict you may be able to point out how 
people in your family take on these different roles. The first role is the blamer, and the blamer is the person who holds others responsible for whatever goes wrong, but tends not to want to take any of the blame him or herself. The second role is the placator, and the placator is also called the peacemaker, and this person hates conflict so much that they will go to any lengths to reduce conflict, and that may mean going along with the, the loudest person in the room just to get them to calm down. Then there's the computer. That tends to be my role. I attempt to use logic and reason rather than emotion to diffuse the situation. I know how much emotion pulls people apart, and so I try to use facts. <laughs> so that's me. And then finally, the distractor. And the distractor will make random, irrelevant comments that have nothing to do with the conflict so that people will get distracted and forget what they were arguing about and maybe stop arguing. One of the things that families tend to do is they have rituals. Family rituals are any repetitive activities that have special meaning for a family that the family depends on and it makes the family bond a little bit better. Now it could be something simple as breakfast every morning or uh, the mom making a special dinner on a special night of the week that everybody just knows is going to happen. Uh, it could be that um, once a year thing that the family does with each other. So there's no specific thing we're talking about when we talk about rituals. They're not uh, necessarily activities that everybody plans on, but they are things that you have a tendency to do time and time again that help the family bond with each other. Certainly one thing that blended families can do is come up with their own specific rituals that may have been taken from one of the other families and, and are therefore imported, but can be something new. The thing about these rituals is that they give the family members something in common. It makes them feel as if they are connected with each other. So when you go to grandma's house for Thanksgiving every year, that is an incredibly important thing. Yes, maybe your family gets into an argument every year, which is also a ritual, but still, that is part of what your family does. It is part of your family identity. And for some people, that is very, very important. I'll bet you can think of a story that your mother has told or your father has told over and over about something that happened before you were born or when you were young or even when she was young that really when you were a kid and you heard it and it might have made you a very annoyed but as you get older you come to realize that these are very important things these family stories that we tell each other give us a sense of our own history they give us a sense of the ways in which we are bonded together. And family stories have a tendency to convey an underlying message about their family. I like to tell you a story that my mother told me time and time again uh, when I was growing up. She was a young girl in, uh, in England during the Second World War and they were bombed constantly and they had to build a bomb shelter out in their backyard. And one day, the uh, sirens went off and they all headed down to the shelter and they were sitting there and nothing was going on. They couldn't hear any bombs. So the dad said that he was going to go to the kitchen and make some tea and bring it down to the bomb shelter because it was tea time. So he went into the kitchen, made the tea, and just as he was coming out the back door, the bombs started to go off and one hit fairly close on the next block and the concussion knocked him backwards into the bathroom and he ended up sitting on the toilet or the loo as they called it with the tea set on the tray and nothing had been spilled but it just blew him like 10 feet backwards and <laughs> he just got up and went down into the shelter 
and of course his whole family was they were so afraid that he'd been injured but nothing happened to him and uh, my mother told that story over and over again <laughs> and what it said to me about our family is that we are very English <laughs> and we just persevere no matter what happens to us I know that you have family stories that you could tell that are similar in nature Despite the fact that families like to tell stories, families are just as likely to have secrets that they really don't want to share with anyone. Secrets that might contain details about religion, health, family issues, family conflicts, financial information. These also kind of reinforce the family's identity because only family members are supposed to know these secrets. There may be secrets in your family that you know of or maybe that you didn't find out about until you were grown. I had a, fa a family secret that I had no idea about until I was an adult and it was quite, uh, well I kind of wondered about it but I wasn't really sure until it was finally disclosed to me after I had uh, reached an age where they knew that it wouldn't make a big difference to me to know it one way or the other. So now that we've talked about both romantic relationships and family relationships, let's talk about the ways in which we can create a positive communication climate for both of those kinds of intimate relationships. So one of the first things that you can do is to use confirming messages and minimize disconfirming messages. Confirming messages are messages and behaviors that indicate how much we value another person. And of course, disconfirming messages are, are behaviors that imply a lack of regard for that person. So in confirming messages, we are indicating that this person has worth and value to us. First of all, the most basic act we can do is recognition. Recognize that that person exists. Recognize that they're worthy of your attention. Uh, make contact with them. Recognition is essential to each of us as individuals. You know, making the effort to communicate with a person is in and of itself a confirming message. Then acknowledgement. Acknowledge that person has feelings and thoughts. You engage in acts of acknowledgement when you ask for someone's opinion, inquire about someone's feelings, and also listen actively. And in our listening chapter, we talked about the things that go into listening actively. People feel better when they believe that other people are truly listening to them. And then finally, endorsement. Now, endorsement doesn't necessarily mean that you just fully accept what that person says. Endorsement has to do with confirming at least something about what that person has said. You can certainly fully endorse what they said if you totally agree, but sometimes you can at least provide what's called partial endorsement. So like when you tell your mom you agree with her feelings and you understand why she feels that way but you don't necessarily go along with her opinion about that thing so at least that person feels like they have been partially acknowledged in this communication disconfirming messages on the other hand we let these slip out often when we are not particularly feeling well, uh, we're just in a bad mood, but sadly, these things tend to happen quite a bit. These are a couple of types of disconfirming messages, and you might be surprised to find out that you've done these as well. Impervious responses are when you simply ignore what somebody has to say. Hey, if you're ignored, imagine how badly it makes you feel, but ignoring somebody when they feel like they have something really important to say can lead to some serious conflict. Verbal abuse. This is where you call someone derogatory names or insult them, put them down, trying to make them specifically feel bad. 
Then there is something called generalized complaining, and I think this happens a lot in relationships, both romantic and family, where you're not really being specific, you're just making a general complaint. The book uses the example of why can't you be more like your brother or you never think about anybody but yourself or why are you doing this now? <laughs> Those kinds of things are very, very common when we're not happy with uh, the behavior of another person. And basically what you're doing is trying to make that person feel badly. Then there's something called an irrelevant response where you respond to what someone is complaining about with something entirely irrelevant to the point at hand that that person is making. It can be a deflection, but just as often it makes that person feel like they haven't even been heard. And finally, an impersonal response. This is where you come back to someone's complaint with something that is a cliche or that implies that you really have no feeling or regard for them. So when you say things like, oh, well, too bad, or life's a struggle, get over it, <laughs> sometimes you really want to say that, but that, again, implies that you are fairly indifferent to their message. These things are things that we do all the time, but if we can start to use more of the confirming messages that I was talking about and less of these disconfirming messages, you're going to notice much better relationships with the people in your life. Finally, one of the best ways to create positive communication climates is to be effective when you give feedback. And if you remember what feedback is, that is the response that you give back to the speaker in a conversation. When people are talking to you and they're describing their problems, you might naturally want to give them your opinion. But one of the best things you can do is kind of hold off on that and provide what is called effective non-evaluative feedback in which you're not evaluating what they're telling you. You're just trying to get more information. So probing, asking questions to draw more information out of that person, paraphrasing where you repeat back in your own words to that person what you believe the messages that they're trying to send you, and offering support, confirming that you understand the validity of their problem even if you're not again totally agreeing with them at this point but you're supporting them sometimes that's all you need to do is just let them know that you hear them and support them then of course sometimes you are required to provide evaluative feedback in other words provide your own opinion definitely you want to provide some kind of praise. Evaluating something isn't just about finding everything negative about it and throwing it back in their face. Try to find something that that person has done well, even if it's just asking for your opinion about it. Let them know that you appreciate that, that they've done a good thing. And then when you criticize, criticize constructively. Don't just say, well, you know, you've screwed up and there's nothing you can do. Try to find a way to express to them what positive steps they can take to make this thing better. It's not just pointing out what's wrong. It's pointing out how it can be fixed, offering ideas for improvement, and being specific. And it's always good to end on praise, too. This is what I call the Oreo cookie method of providing praise, and I often do it in my speech classes when I'm evaluating speeches. I start with what they did that was right. I tell them the areas that they need to work on and how to fix it, and then I end up with something that they did that was good or what good will come of them making these changes the next time they give a speech. So in conclusion, every relationship that we have will benefit from these efforts to improve your communication climate. But you can certainly also use these things in your work and friendship relationships. So try to practice these positive communication behaviors and see what a difference it makes in your life. This is the end 
of the lecture to accompany chapter 10.